You may have noticed Wanda's changed a little bit over there at the piano this morning. They got a brand new baby girl in the house. She didn't wait till tomorrow. So, so James uh, is filling in. James is a great guy. This morning, I want to invite you to open your Bibles to 1 Corinthians chapter 15. And uh, 1 Corinthians 15 is one of the greatest passages in my, in my opinion that I read in the New Testament concerning the fact of our faith and, and what God has given to us. Because, you know, this is what I find out along the way is that every single one of us face struggles and every single one of us have times that, that, we're, that we're overwhelmed and we feel overcome and, and defeat seems imminent and a part of what life is all about. And so how do I handle those things, and, and how do I handle those pieces of news? You know, on a lighter note, we tease each other back and forth, and, you know, I've, I've been able, uh, I've texted Matt uh, for the last several months during the football season, teasing him about uh, Tennessee right when I know it's time for him to lead the church in worship, and uh, so that he's all encouraged right there. But uh, you Alabama fans this morning probably need a little bit of encouragement, too, after that loss last night, and, and then those of you that, that follow Auburn, there's a guy here from Andalusia, the last service, he had on a, a nice new Auburn uh, pullover, and I said, man, that's nice. He said, yeah, they're giving them away now. And uh, after the Georgia Bulldogs took a big bite out of them, but, you know, we can tease back and forth because, you know, football is just football. It's just a game. It really doesn't matter. It has no real effect with, with time and with eternity. But, but there are other things that come our way that, that upset us and, and, and that uh, cause us uh, consternation and that cause us pain and, and cause us to question. And uh, we go through presidential elections and national elections like we've had this week and so many people disappointed and so many people just feeling like God was going to come through and he was going to place a, a particular kind of leader that we were seeking after. And those of us that fell asleep early before the results were in, I woke up and at 11.30 and turned on the television and saw that the election had been called and turned it back off. And there are other th things that happened in life that, that broke my heart and the tears were coming from within and a brokenness and a sense of helplessness within. And so through the week, we all face those kinds of challenges. But this morning, what I want to share with you, that no matter what the challenge may be, whether it be an interpersonal relationship, whether it be a family struggle, whether it be financial crisis, no matter what it is, that our God promises us this one key thing. He promises us victory. And in 1 Corinthians chapter 50, uh, 15, uh, the very first verse, the Bible says, this is the Apostle Paul writing, it says, Now I make known to you, brethren, the gospel which I preached to you, which also you received, and which you also stand, by which you also are saved, if you hold fast the word which I preached to you, unless you believed in vain. For I delivered to you as of first importance what I also received, that Christ died for our sins according to the Scriptures, and that he was buried, and that he was raised on the third day, according to the Scriptures. Now, there are many theologians uh, who say that this 15th chapter of, of 1 Corinthians is the highest revelation uh, to be found in the Word of God. In the drama called The Trial of Jesus by John Mansfield, there's a, a striking passage in which the Roman centurion, in command of the soldiers at the cross that day, comes back to Pilate to give his report of the day's activity, of the day's work. And after the report is given, Pilate's wife calls the centurion aside and begs him to tell her how the prisoner died. And after telling her the story, she asks this question, well, do you think that he is really dead? And the centurion responds and says, I don't think so. And she says to him, well, where is he? And this Roman centurion replies and says, let loose in the world, lady, who, uh, where no one can stop his truth. 
Let loose in the world, lady, where no one can stop his truth. And so this is proven to, to, to be tr so true. For as soon as the Lord Jesus Christ was risen and ascended, uh, the, he empowered his disciples to make known to all the world the truth that he came and he lived and he died and he was buried. But he overcame the grave and he rose on the third day. As a matter of fact, before the Lord Jesus Christ would ascend back into heaven, he states to his disciples in Acts chapter 1, verse 8, But you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and you will be my witnesses. In the actual Greek it reads, you will be witnesses of me into all the world, into Jerusalem, into uh, uh, Judea, and into Samaria, and to the very uttermost, remotest, part, remotest parts of the world. And you know, we're more than just his witness that he sent out. We're witnesses of him. We're witnesses witnesses of what the Lord Jesus Christ has done in our hearts. We're witnesses of what he has done in our lives. We're witnesses of how he has, has saved us from corruption, how he has saved us from, from decay, how he saved us from putrefaction, how he has saved us and made us whole because he did something marvelous and he did something spectacular. He did a one-of-a-kind thing when he went to Calvary and died and was buried and rose again. And so this morning, what I'd look, like us to look at in these verses that lie before us in 1 Corinthians 15 is I would like for us to look at, at, at three aspects of the buried, crucified, and risen Lord, uh, the aspects of, of the, of the uh, indisputable fact of His resurrection and of the indispensable faith that He gives us and of the irresistible force that He has given because of what He's done. Now, when you look at the resurrection of Jesus Christ as an indisputable fact, we find that the apostle says in verse number 1, Now I make known to you, brethren, the gospel which I preached to you, which also you received, and also that which you stand. In the NIV, it says, I want to remind you. And this is what I find about my faith. This is what I find about who I am as a, as a Christian and as a husband, as a father, as a friend, as a pastor even. I find that there are so many times in my life I have to be reminded. I have to be reminded of what Christ has done for me. I've got to be reminded of not only what He has done, but what He has doing, and be reminded of that promise that He has given me that He will yet to fulfill. I have to be reminded because me, just like you, oftentimes overwhelmed, overcome, feeling defeat, feeling like the score has been run up too much for any significant change to happen in the last minute of the ball game. And so he said in verses 3 and 4, For I delivered unto you that of first importance, uh, which I also received, that Christ died for our sins according to the Scriptures. He was buried and that he was raised on the third day according to the Scriptures. So with insight and with awareness and with perception, the perception of a theologian, and with brilliant intensity, he as a truth seeker, declares the resurrection of Jesus Christ was, first of all, a prophetical fact. It was a prophecy that was made in the Old Testament. He said he was raised on the third day according to the Scripture. Now, the Scripture they had is this, is they didn't have the New Testament as we have the New Testament today. The canon of Scripture had not been put together as of this time. What they had was the Old Testament. Paul was a Hebrew scholar. He was raised in the tribe of Benjamin. He was a Hebrew of Hebrews. He was a Pharisee by, by nature. He knew the Old Testament, and he knew that Old Testament very well. And, 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 there were, and there he was, and, and as that student, in his familiarity, he could declare with a categorical impressiveness that Christ, he was raised on the third day according to the Scriptures. In other words, the law, the prophets, and the Psalms all predicted the resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ. In the, in the, in the books of the law, we read in the book of Genesis, in chapter 3, verse number 15, God is speaking, and the words being put down. He said, I'll put enmity between you and the woman. In other words, he's speaking to the serpent. He's speaking to the snake. He's speaking to our enemy of old. I'm going to put enmity between you and the woman, and between your offspring and hers, and he will crush your head and you will strike his heel. Now let me tell you something. If a snake bites you on the heel, it's going to hurt. It's going to swell and you're going to limp around. But if you crush a snake on the head, you're going to kill that old serpent. 
When we first moved here, one of the things that we had an abundance of at our house over off of Airport Road was an abundance of pygmy rattlesnakes. And my kids, they were little, you know, uh, they were four and two and six weeks old, and, and they would see me, you know, that pygmy rattlesnake would be on the ground, and, and I would crush its head. Listen, that thing didn't crawl anymore after I crushed its head. I was heavier then uh, even than I am now. I crushed its head good. And one day I, I came to the realization that I was being watched when I looked out the back door, and there my two-year-old son was in his cowboy boots and shorts crushing the head of a pygmy rattlesnake. Isn't that wild? But this is what God said. He said, you're going, you're going to wound him, but he is going to give you a mortal blow. He will crush your head. And in the psalm, the Bible says, You will not abandon me to the grave, nor will, let your, nor will you let your Holy One see decay. Listen, Jesus is only in the grave those three days. His body did not decay. He said, You've made known to me the path of life. You will fill me with the joy in your presence, with eternal pleasures at your right hand. He's talking about that resurrection. His body will not go undergo decay. And in the prophets, we come to Isaiah chapter 53, in which the Lord says, The Lord was pleased to crush him, putting him to grief. If he would render himself a guilt offering, he will see his offspring, he will prolong his days, and the good pleasure of the Lord will prosper in his hand. And as a result of the anguish of his soul, he will see it and be satisfied by his knowledge. The righteous one, my servant, will justify the many as he will bear their iniquities. And so we have the, the Old Testament. And, and, and so for Paul, it was a prophetical fact that the Lord Jesus Christ, he came, he lived, he died, he was buried, and he rose again. But not only was it a prophetical fact, to him it was also a historical fact. He said in verses 3 and 4, he said, Christ died for our sins. He was raised on the third day according to the Scriptures. Dr. F. F. Bruce, one of those theologians I heard quoted so many times in, in seminary, I thought, well, what else can F. F. Bruce say along the way? But he points out that these words constitute one of the earliest commentaries, one of the earliest pieces of documentary evidence concerning the Lord Jesus Christ. For these words, this statement is dated less than 25 years after the resurrection. He goes on and says, This statement affected everyone who heard it. And of the tens of thousands of people who were transformed, Paul names three. He names the Apostle Peter, his life being transformed. And he uh, mentions the Apostle James, his life being transformed in verses 5 and 7 of our text. And then he refers to himself in verse 8, his life being transformed. You know, before the Lord got a hold of him, he was all about putting it out. He was all about being about the same business that that centurion was and shutting down the gospel message of Jesus Christ. And, and one day on the road to Emmaus, he had a, an encounter with the Lord Jesus Christ in which he was struck blind and he heard the Lord speak and he got radically saved saved at that moment. And when he got radically saved, he got radically turned on to the power and to the majesty and to the victory that the Lord Jesus Christ gives. So to Paul, it was an irrefutable fact, both historically and prophetically. But now get a hold of this. To Paul, it was also indispensable with faith. In verses 14 and 17 and 19, we're going to look at this. That indispensable faith. He says in verse 14, And if Christ has not been raised, then our preaching is in vain. Your faith is also in vain. In number 17, he says, And if Christ has not been raised, your faith is worthless. You are still in your sin. And then in verse 19, he goes on and says, If we have hope in Christ in this life only, we are of all men most to be pitied. And so in these words, the Apostle Paul, uh, you know, gives us the, the estimate of the significance of the death, burial, and yes, the resurrection 
of the Lord Jesus Christ. He said everything that we hold dear in faith rests upon this fact, upon the fact that Jesus Christ is not dead, that Jesus Christ is risen as he said. Let me tell you something. When Buddha lived and walked on the earth, he died and he laid in the tomb and he's not come back to life. When the uh, thousands of gods of the Hindus die, they're buried, they're laid in their tomb, they don't come back to life. Let me tell you this. Muhammad, the, the founder of Islam, when he walked upon the earth, he lived and he died and he was buried and they still celebrate his tomb. He's still there. Let me tell you something, Jesus Christ, he came and he lived and he taught and he healed and he walked among us and he was crucified. He died and he was buried. But here's the glorious fact of our Lord. Our Jesus is not dead. He's alive. Yes, he's alive forevermore. He is alive. If Christ has not been raised, our preaching is in vain, our faith is fault, false, and our life is miserable and without hope. And I want you to know something. When we go through the struggles in life and when we go through the difficulties in life, we can always come back to this measure, Jesus is alive and I don't have to be hopeless and I don't have to be miserable. Because let me tell you, my faith gets challenged. I woke up Wednesday morning with a deeply challenged faith a deeply deeply challenged faith and I'm not wanting to talk to God about it that's how challenged I am I'm challenged this irresistible force that I'm going to talk about in a minute becomes that indispensable faith that God has given you and he says this, he says there has to be faith in the preaching of Christ. Wednesday morning I'm saying, I don't want to preach Christ. I know that you find that hard to believe, but you know where I'm, you understand what I'm saying? You hit those ruts, you hit those potholes. Sometimes it's a sinkhole, and there's a challenge to your faith. And he says here in verse 14, if Christ has not been raised, our preaching is in vain. Our preaching's in vain. You know, what is preaching? It, it represents the word of Christ, everything that Jesus ever spoke. It represents every healing word. It represents every command. It represents every promise that the Lord Jesus Christ ever spoke. And if he didn't rise from the dead, you know, how can we trust his words? How can we believe the claims that he made? How can we aspire to the standards that he set? In other words, if Christ was not raised, then our preaching is in vain. But let me tell you something, Christ is risen. And as a result, every single word that the Lord Jesus Christ ever spoke, it rings through, through and it rings through with clarity and authority and it vibrates within our lives and we can trust Him implicitly. Because even in our weakest moments when our faith is smothered, that vibration of His love and of His power, of, of His very touch, it vibrates in us. It shakes the dust loose. It cuts loose the cobwebs. It helps the light of heaven rise, uh, shine within in us that we can have a picture of his glory and be touched by his grace and, 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 and relax and live abundantly as Pastor Dan prays in the fame of the glory of God in the fame of his glory so life doesn't have to be hopeless we can live with that kind of a victory and, and where is our hope you know, if we don't believe, where's the good news that we long for? You know, here we, we find that this is the good news, that Christ died, and he was buried, and he rose again. And, and, and this is old news, and it's new news, and it's good news. Jesus is alive. And, and there's faith also in the power of the cross. Paul says in verse 17, he says, If he's not been raised, our, our faith is worthless. We're still in our sins. If the Lord Jesus Christ never rose from the dead, then Calvary means nothing at all. It means nothing at all. Because other men have been crucified. And Jesus must be numbered among the many. 
But on the other hand, if he truly rose from the dead, then Calvary represents a unique redemptive act of God providing forgiveness and cleansing and salvation for people like you and me. Paul would write to the Romans in Romans chapter 4, verse number 25, and he said, He who was delivered over because of our transgressions. He's saying he died for you, he died for me. He died for the transgression, for the sin, for the fault, for the failure that you and I made. He was delivered over for our transgressions, and he was raised because uh, of our justification. The message translation puts it this way: the sacrifice Jesus made, uh, the sacrifice to Jesus made us fit for God, set us right with God, and, and now there's forgiveness and there's pardon through the blood of Calvary's cross because of the resurrection of Jesus Christ that He made, investing in us and 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 and, and giving death and giving hell that death blow. In 1 Peter, in the message translation, Peter writes and says, What a God we have. What a God we have. I mean, think about that. We sing that song, do we not? What a God we have. What a mighty God we serve. What a mighty God we serve. You know, heaven and earth adore Him. Angels bow before Him. What kind of God do we serve? A mighty God. He is a mighty and awesome God. I wish I could relate to you the depth of who this God is. But this God is awesome and mighty. And the Lord Jesus Christ, because of what He's done, He holds the key to both death and hell. He holds the key, for He has overcome sin, that if we put our faith and our trust in Him, we can have life, and we can have the abundance of life. And that's why the apostles able to write a little bit later in this chapter, Oh, death, where is your victory? Oh, death, where, where is your, your power? Where is the sting of death? Where is it? Because the Lord Jesus Christ has rendered sin and death and hell powerless. Absolutely powerless. So Peter says, what a God we have and how fortunate we are to have him. This father of our master Jesus, because Jesus was raised from the dead. We've been given a brand new life and have everything to live for. You know, here's the the, the prospect that's before us. Either the Lord Jesus rose from the dead or he did not. It's an either or kind of thing. There's no gray matter in there whatsoever. If not, then Christianity is nothing but nonsense. It's both false and powerless. It's false because Jesus said he would rise and he didn't. It's powerless because he's not alive to make good his promise. If Christ was not raised, we Christians are still in our sins. But thank God, he's alive. He's alive forever. Amen. Christ is risen indeed, alive forevermore, holding the keys of of hell and death. And that brings about a faith in the very prospect of who we are, the church of Jesus Christ, the bride of Christ. In the 19th verse, it says, If we've hoped in Christ in this life only, we are of all men most to be pitied. When Jesus Christ was here on the earth, he said to his disciples, it's Matthew 16, 18, message translation, And now I'm going to tell you who you are, who you really are. You know, so many times, individual Christians and churches get so down. They think, I'm nothing. I don't have faith. I don't have this. I'm powerless. And Christ speaks to Peter and says, you're Peter. You're a rock. And this is the rock on which I will put together my church, a church so expansive with energy that not even the gates of hell will be able to keep it out. Listen. Our faith. I was in a meeting the other night, and I was listening to someone talk about the end of the church. And I'm thinking, if you never read the Word of God, I said, we don't know where we're going to find the answer. And I bumped Dan with my elbow, and I said, right here in the Word. The church is not ending. It may be changing, but it's not ending. The church has a glorious future. God is not done with His church. You know, the prediction was fulfilled on the day of Pentecost 
uh, when, when uh, the, the, the nucleus of the Christian church was brought together into being. When Jesus said, upon this rock I will build my church and the gates of hell won't be able to keep it out. Those men had gathered in Jerusalem just as Jesus had told them. He said, I want you to wait until you are endowed, endued with power from on high in, in Acts chapter 1. And he said, you're going to receive that power. And, and by the time we move a little bit further along, that power comes down. And these disciples, they stand up and they preach and they preach with boldness. And people think, man, there's something wrong with these guys. They've been in the wine a little bit too early in the day. But they preached in every man's language. And the Bible says that about 3,000 people came to know Christ Jesus as their Lord that very day. There's power in the name of Jesus. And in that power, as the Lord Jesus Christ was poured out there, He pours it out with us today. And that church dispersed from Jerusalem to conquer the earth. And it was the message of the resurrection that was the driving power behind it. And because Jesus rose from the dead, I don't have to be hopeless. I know this. I may, you know, I may vote for presidents and I may vote for councilmen, but the Bible says that my king is the one who holds their hearts in his hand. The Bible tells me that the Lord Jesus Christ is more than an elected official. He's the conquering Christ. On his on him is the is the word. He's the King of Kings and He is the Lord of Lords, and He will be so throughout all of of eternity. I have victory in that name of Jesus. It's okay, you can clap. And the church of Jesus Christ has withstood uh, attack socially and politically and intellectually all down to the centuries. And often she has uh, seemed to be doomed and dead, and, and the grave diggers like Voltaire have been busy to dig the grave. But always like her Savior, she has risen from the grave, and she has rolled away the stone. And the only fact of the res- and it's only the fact of the resurrection that pushes us onward and that, that pushes us upward. And even more, the church has a glorious destiny. Far beyond those days, she has that eternal future. The Lord Jesus Christ who gave himself for us, who gave himself for us as individuals, is coming back again. As you read beyond Acts 1.8, you come to that place where Jesus begins to ascend back into glory. Man, I can't imagine what a sad moment that must have been. Can't imagine what it must have felt like. I mean, he's, he's my Lord. Can you imagine what those apostles are thinking, but it's Jesus? It's like you stand on the driveway and watch the loved one pull away. Those disciples, they stand and they watch them rise into the sky. And the cloud was enveloping. And the two men that stood there as witnesses, actually angels, and this is what they said. I'm going to quote it in the King James because that's how I memorized it. Ye men of Galilee, why stand ye here gazing into the skies, gazing at the stars? This same Jesus, this same Jesus will so return as you've watched him go. Now get this, this same Jesus, not an impersonator. You know, when Elvis died, we've got impersonators, right? But this same Jesus, this same Jesus, you know, they can do these holograms. Uh, Somebody's telling me about this church that kind of holograms the pastor up on stage in two different rooms. I said, man, it looks so real. Well, that's cool. That's neat. Great. But Jesus isn't sending a hologram. He's coming back. The Bible says that this same Jesus, he's going to appear. This same Bible tells me this same Jesus that rose from the grave, he's coming back. There's going to be the shout. There's going to be the trumpet blast. And he's going to call his church. And guess what? We're going up to meet him. We're going to meet him. And the struggles of this life will be over. They'll be over. But in the meantime, we, we, we follow after him. In Ephesians 5, 27, he says that he wants to present us to himself, the church in all of her glory, having no spot or wrinkle or any such thing, but that she would be holy and blameless. An anonymous writer said, the church of Jesus Christ owes its very existence to this, to this fact. The graveyard of the world, there is a wide open tomb, one that's opened and empty, an empty sepulcher. That's why we're here, because the tomb is empty. 
Now think about this as an irresistible force. In verse 57, the scripture says, But thanks be to God who gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. The NIV puts an exclamation point at the end, thanks be to God. But thanks be to God. If the opening of this chapter, you know, deals with the fact of the resurrection, and this amazing chapter in its heart deals with uh, well, uh, the, the faith of the resurrection, then the concluding verses speak of the, the force of the resurrection. And it's a revealed force. Paul states it in Romans chapter 1, verses 3 and 4. He says, concerning his son, who is declared the son of God with power, by the resurrection from the dead, according to the Spirit of holiness, Jesus Christ our Lord. You know, the Lord Jesus Christ made some extraordinary claims before he went to the cross. He likened his body to an earthly temple, and he announced in John 2.19, destroy this temple in three days and I'll raise it up. In John 10, 17, he said, For this reason the Father loves me, because I lay down my life, so that I may take it up again. No one takes it from me, but I lay it down and on my own initiative. I have the authority to lay it down. I have the authority to take it up again. This commandment I receive from my Father. You know, his statements were vindicated when the stone was rolled away. His statements were vindicated when the stone was rolled away. The stone was rolled away not to let Jesus out of the tomb. Never think it was rolled away to let Jesus out. It was rolled away to let us in. And what did we find when we went in? We found the grave clothes neatly folded up right there. Neatly folded. Laid out. We found an empty tomb. For Jesus is who he claimed to be. But not only... is the fact that he was not there before us. He sends us out into the world as a people who've been released. We have a released force within us. Once again, I remind you, he says in Acts 1.8, but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you. And you'll be witnesses of me in Jerusalem, Judea, and Samaria, to the very remotest ends of the earth. You know, in your life, you're a shining light. Think of Judy's witness over five years in leading her friend to Christ who was baptized today. Salt and light. That's what our youth department's adopted. Salt and light. Salt of the earth prevents decay. Light dispels the darkness. God's called us to be salt and light. And so here we've been released. You know, when people feel hopeless, like when you blow the national championship against Texas, you can be encouraged it's just a game. You know, it's just football, y'all, right? But when the trials come in your life, listen, and your heart's breaking down and your faith is weak and it's smothering, you don't even want to talk to God about it. It's so smothered. You're still released. And Jesus, in releasing you now, this is, this is the um, irony. In releasing you, he doesn't let you go. And he pours his, he pours. I don't know how to explain this. And I don't want it to sound funky and I don't want you to identify me in one way theologically or another. But he pours faith to help my weakness. Remember the New Testament, Lord, I believe. Help my unbelief. What does he do? He pours that faith in us. He lifts us up. He encourages us. So that no matter what is around us, He's still the risen Lord. He's still alive. He's still on the throne. And that throne will never be empty. Never.
this morning, and there's people here, some of you need to put your faith in Christ for the very first time. And maybe it kind of makes a little bit of sense to you, and you need to do that. There's some of you here today, God's calling you to be a part of the work that He's doing here in this church. He's calling us to make decisions. He's calling us to step up to the line. I don't know if you sense what God's doing in the church as I do, but I sense God has got a new wave of power moving across Village Baptist Church. I just see it. I'm here every day. And I'm excited about what God's doing here. I'm excited for the staff that's been here. I look at that bulletin. Did y'all notice the bulletin today? Isn't that cool? And you know, at lunch, Dan, Dan said, well, it'd be really cool if a flag was in color. And I just said, well, tell her to put it in color if you want to, but remember, you know, it's got to be stuffed with all those things going on, so you'll have to work late helping her stuff it. And you and, you and Kim got a date night tonight. He said, oh, well, we won't color it. Well, Tracy just heard us. And man, she had that thing colored before we knew it. And Tracy, if you're here, thank you so much for that. And Linda and, and Betty and Mickey and Shelly and, and Vicki and Paul. But, you know, I tell you, I'm just getting, I'm so glad that Dan's on board with us as, as our student pastor. He's a man of God. He's a man of the Word. Our kids are being taught the Word of God. I'm so excited about Grace coming, though, with Matt. I love these two. We, you know, when we first met and, and all, um, I called him. I thought it'd be a five-minute phone call. We talked for two hours the first time. I mean, God just brought something between uh, among us. And when I look at what God is doing in this place, y'all, I am so excited. Yes, there's been some battles in, in the background, but there's victory in Christ. 